John 14, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 11 here today. Now, after Jesus has explained to the disciples that he is going away and they cannot follow him now, and he's told them that they are all going to stumble because of him that very night, the disciples are a little freaked out. They're a little dismayed. They're a little fearful. They're questioning what's going on. Where are you going? How can we get to where you're going? And all of the, these questions come up in their mind. And so Jesus is seeking in these, in chapter 14, 15, and 16, to really calm their troubled hearts. And he's in each of these statements, in each of these instructions that he gives to them, it is to that end to calm their heart. And so today, what, he, what we're going to look at in our text this morning is really how he tries to just calm their hearts by letting them know that he is the way. That if they know him, that's really all they need to know. If they have watched and listened and seen what he's done, they will get there. They will believe in him and they will get to the, the desired end of heaven. And so that's basically his encouragement to them. Now when he says this to them, they, they object. Thomas has an objection. Philip has an objection. Let's read those objections. In verse 4, it says, Jesus said, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? So he's questioning now, what do you believe? Do you believe this? He says to them there, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So Jesus here is seeking again to calm these men and their troubled hearts, their questioning hearts. And so he tells them here, you know the way, you know where I'm going. And they immediately object, no, we don't know the way. How can we know the way? And so they're, they're just struggling in their minds. You can tell and sense this struggle because they have heard what he has said and they are questioning, what's going to happen to us? How are we going to find you? If you're going away, we're going to be left here and we don't want to be left here without you. And so they ask him this question. How can we know the way? And Jesus simply explains to them in just one of the most powerful verses, a verse that probably most of you can quote by heart. This is one of the most famous verses of Scripture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus said to them, look, the answer is very simple. And it's, and it's essential that you don't make it more complicated then he has made it. It's a very simple yet profound message that he gives to them. He's just saying, I am the way. If you know me, then you're going to get there. I am the way. And knowledge and knowing me, having a personal relationship with me, is how you're going to get there. Now this is really an essential thing because many times in Christian churches, it's all about knowledge. You see, you have to know the truth. You have to know certain truths. You have to know 
what you're supposed to do and follow certain regulations and rules. But salvation has nothing to do with knowing the truth. It's knowing the person who gave the truth. That's the answer. That's the simplicity of the answer. If you know him, you're going to know his truth. If you know him, you're going to know his life. If you know him, you're going to know the way. Because his truth reveals that. The, the life that he gives to you is proof that that is the truth. And so Jesus gives them just such a simple answer here. So remember this. Say, uh, salvation is not knowing a certain truth. It's knowing the person who gave the truth. You see, Satan knows the truth. He knows all about Jesus. But he does not believe in Jesus. He does not know him in the way you know him. So there is a big difference. James makes this point very clearly in his epistle. He says, the devils believe. They know and believe. But they are not following and obedient to him. So there's a big difference. And it's a simple difference, but it is a real difference. Now, in this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus covers the three biggest issues in life. It's the three biggest issues that people struggle with, which are, what is the right way to live your life? I mean, that's what every parent teaches their children, is it not? What's the right way to live your life? And some parents teach one thing, and other parents teach another. And then the second issue, what is truth? What is truth? Remember when Pilate asked that question of Jesus? He said, what is truth? Well, the truth was standing right in front of him, and he didn't see it. He didn't know it. The third question is, where is real life found? Where can you find and experience the life that God truly intends for you? And the answer is, in Jesus. It's that simple. It can't be found in some system, some regulation, some ritual. It's found in a person. It's not even found in a church. It's found in a person. The person of Jesus Christ. You have to know him one-on-one. -on -one. You have to have a personal relationship which he described as a relationship of faith. Down here in verse 11 makes it very clear. Believe me. You got to believe in me. That's the key. And so that personal relationship with him, do you have that this morning? Do you cultivate that personal relationship with him every single day? Because that is what Christianity is all about. It's, it's not coming to church. It's knowing the God who established his church on a simple confession of faith in him. You have to know him and the power of his resurrection. So what is truth? What is the way? What is real life? These are the moral issues of life, the truth issues of life, the life issues of life. And everything that you see and experience in your life is dealing with one of these three things. So every religious system on this earth, every world religion, every uh, pseudo-Christian religion, uh, some of the aberrant Christian groups around, they're all telling you what way to go. And they're telling you what truth to believe so that you can experience what they believe is life. So you have to determine what is the truth, what is truly correct. So the simple answer, receive Jesus, walk with him, you will find that road. And that's what the word way here means. It means the road. I am the road. I am the truth. If you want to, if you want to get to the Father, it's through me. Now, my personal encouragement to you is to say to you today, I have found everything I was looking for when I was searching for truth, for life. I found that. 
It's in Christ. And he is the only place that that life is found. And that's really why Jesus goes on and he tacks on now this little statement, the second statement here in verse 6. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is an information that Thomas didn't ask for, but he got it anyway. He said, what's the way? Jesus said, I'm the way. But why does he tack on this little statement here at the end? No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, he's making it absolutely clear. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only place you will ever find life and ever know the Father. That's the only way. There isn't a whole bunch of other religious leaders out there in the world that are going to lead you to this way and truth and life. It's not going to happen. Now, many times when you bring this particular point up to people, they say, well, that is just so narrow. You are so narrow. And you have to say to them, yes, I am. Because Jesus is the one who said this. Always make that point when you share with people. Just say, look, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with Jesus. Okay, that's, that's the bottom line. This is not my idea or not Calvary Chapel's idea or whatever church you're going to. It's not their idea. It's Christ's idea. You can't say it any more simply than this. No one, no one, no one on this planet will ever come to the Father except it be through Him. Now, when people say that's just too narrow, I say to them, well, it it's, is narrow, but it is so wide an opportunity that He will accept anyone who will believe in Him. Now, that's pretty all-inclusive, is it not? I mean, Revelation chapter twenty-two, seventeen, where the Bible ends... This is what it says. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You can't say it any better than that. Whoever desires and wants this life, all you got to do is come. That's it. Now, whoever means anybody can come. But that what they're arguing with is the narrowness of coming through Christ only. That's what the argument is. But in reality, his love is incredibly wide. He will receive anyone who will believe in him. And so this message is so powerful. It is an essential message that you declare to others. Now, how, do you, how does Jesus respond to the issue, the idea that what he's just stated is too narrow? Well, here is his response. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. So Jesus is acknowledging that this is a narrow gate. And he says, and for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So here he gives two different roads. But these two different roads end up in two completely opposite ends. One destruction, one life. So Jesus makes it very clear. He's, he knows exactly what he is saying what he is teaching. Jesus also said in John 10, verse 8, he said, referring to other shepherds, he said, all, not some, not most, he said, all, whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So Jesus knows exactly what he's claiming. He claims this over and over again in his teaching. And so this message is something that is an essential message of the gospel. All roads do not lead to God. And so when people say that, 
How do you respond to them? Well, all religions are the same, Steve. You, you know, you just, you just so, uh, you just have such a narrow view, and you know, you're just your understanding is just incomplete. All roads, all religions will get me there. And how do you respond when that takes place? Can you adequately, competently explain to people why all roads do not lead to God? Why all religious systems are not the same? How, can you, how do you explain that? Well, let me just give you a couple of ways. First, logic. I usually just stop and I just say with people to people, hey, look, you know, if there were, say, let's pick 10 different religions, would God take 10 different ways to get to one God of the universe? Would that not be confusing? Especially when those 10 different religious systems all teach contradictory truth. You say, people respond, well, they don't contradict each other. Well, that only reveals that they don't, they never have studied any of these other religious systems. If you study them, you will come to the conclusion they are all contradictory. Thousands of contradictory messages would do what to someone? Confuse them. That's it. Does God want to confuse people? I don't think so. I think he wants to make it as simple as he possibly can. As simple as he can to bring people to himself. And so, how does he do that? Well, he does it simply by giving them an, a very easy to understand message. Do you realize that probably 50% of the people that Jesus spoke to were illiterate? They probably could not read or write. The other 50% probably could. But for people who do not read, do not write, do not, they've never had a philosophy class, they never had a critical thinking class, um, they've never, never even thought about that. They just, they're just farmers. They're people who are shopkeepers. They're just trying to make a living. And why would Jesus make his message complicated, difficult to understand? He didn't. It's very simple. He said, I'm the way. Put your faith in me and you'll get there. You can't say it any simpler than that. In fact, there's no other way you're getting there except through me. And so he says it's very simple and they understood. Secondly, after you deal with logic, I encourage you to take people to the scripture and just say, look at what the other religious systems teach about, say, let's just pick two things. First, Jesus. Who is he? What do the other world religions, say the Eastern religions, what do they believe about Jesus? Well, he's just one spiritual leader or one guru in the line of Many gurus. That's it. Or in the non-Christian cults in the United States or around the world, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe Jesus is an angel. Mormonism, they believe that Jesus is a god, just like you can become a god. Christian science, they believe Jesus was just a good man. Unity or Baha'i. They believe Jesus was another prophet, another avatar in the long list of avatars and prophets, such as Muhammad or Moses or whatever. And so these individuals all see Jesus in a very different way. They teach that he is a very different person than the other group teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God, come in human flesh. And John 1.1 1, 1 states it as simply as you can. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or literally, God was the Word. In John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That's Jesus Christ. So, God was the Word. So you have to say, they're all contradictory. So which one is the truth? 
which one has the proof to back up their statements. That's what we're going to get to later in our, in our studies. The second issue is how is someone saved or is made right before God? Well, the Bible says that a Christian, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, a man is saved by grace through faith and that not of himself, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So God saves by grace through faith. That's what Jesus taught. And this gift of salvation is not of yourselves. It's something that is given to you as a gift. And it cannot be earned or obtained by works. No work can obtain me this salvation. It's a gift. And that's what grace is. And yet, when you look at all the other religious systems, every single one of them, they are all alike. They teach, each teaches a different form of works, a system of works whereby you can save yourself. You can cleanse yourself of your sins. And that is the difference. These are all contradictory to one another, and they are contradictory to the gospel of Christ. And so there is no question in my mind they aren't all the same and they aren't all leading me to the same end. That is a, a fallacy. And so if you doubt what I'm saying, all you have to do, just do a Google search on your computer. What does uh, Buddhism teach about Jesus? What does Christianity teach? And just, just look at the difference between what is, what is clearly taught in their writings. And so this is an issue that Jesus made so clear to them. This was to be a comfort to them. I am the way. You don't have to go looking around and try and figure out some other way. Or is this really the true way? I am the way. And I am the truth. I am the light. Now, second here, how does Jesus answer Philip's objection? He said, show us the Father. We want to see the Father. Now, most likely what Philip was asking for here was some kind of revelation as Moses asked the, the Lord for. He, he wanted to see some kind of manifestation of God to quell his fears. And yet... and. In one, for one point, I think we should applaud Philip because he wants to know God. He wants to know who he is. And yet, in the second sense, he is basically reproved here by Christ. Why? Notice what he says to him in verse 9. He says, Have I been with you so long, and yet have you not known me, Philip? So here's a reproof. This disappointed Jesus. You say, well, does Jesus get disappointed? Yes, he does. He gets disappointed with this man because, yes, the desire was good. The desire was right. But he should have known who this man was that was standing in front of him. He should have known from just simply all of what he had seen throughout the three and a half years of ministry. That was the proof that he was the Son of God. And so he, he is bothered by this. He basically is reproving him because of this, this question. So why, does, why is God disappointed with him? Because he expected more from him, which he does from every individual who has been with him for any length of time. Now, do you realize that as a Christian, the more you know, the more you are responsible for brand new Christian, you're responsible for very little. A person who has walked with the Lord for years, they know the scripture in and out, inside and out, they are responsible for much more. Every time you come to Bible study, every time you get into the word on your own, you are responsible now for even more. And so that is the principle that is taking place here. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48. 
there at the end of that statement or that verse, notice what Jesus said. To whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So, notice, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. It's powerful. So, the more you know, the more you are responsible for. And that is why Jesus says here these words to this man. Because he should have known. He should have known. And yet he did not. He was still wondering. Still questioning. And so this man had a a great desire to know God. Applaud him for that. Do you have that desire to know God? Is that the desire, the deepest desire of your soul? To know him. You know, Paul said in Philippians 3.10. He said there that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what drove Paul. Is that what drives you? I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. If that's your motivating force, if that's your, the drive inside of you, then it's a good thing. And you need to pursue him and follow him. Now secondly, notice here that Jesus says this to him in verse 9 again. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now this is probably one of the most staggering statements that Jesus has ever made. It's one of the most powerful statements. It's a revelation to us that he's saying, Philip, if you're looking at me, you are looking at the Father. We are one in the same. Whatever you see here is exactly who the Father is. Now this is what the Scripture teaches throughout. Jesus said earlier in John 10, I and my Father, we are one. Very powerful statement. Jesus said the same all through His ministry. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, there the Apostle said, speaking of Jesus, who being in the brightness of His glory. That that word brightness literally means radiance. The radiance of His glory. And the express image of His person. Notice that word, those two words express image is one Greek word that literally means the photograph. The exact likeness of the Father. So He is the visible image of the invisible God. And there he declares, who upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the scripture is so clear. He is this image of the Father, the express image of the Father. So visibly, he, when you look at him, You're seeing the Father. Now, what that does is remove forever this question about the bad God of the Old Testament, the mean God of the Old Testament, and the good God of the New Testament. Have you ever heard people say that? They say, well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Jesus came because that guy in the Old Testament, I don't want to deal with him. And... And the, the guy in the New Testament, I like him. Well, they're the exact same individuals, which only means you don't understand fully the love of God and the holiness of God. You see, those two issues are essential. They are essential balance of your view of who the Lord is. I mean, when Jesus drove out the money changers out of the temple, with a cat of nine tails. That's the bad guy of the Old Testament. Okay? And that's the same guy of the Old Testament. And he said, get out of here. And when you see the Jesus of the New Testament coming in the book of Revelation, who comes to judge and make war, that's the same bad guy of the Old Testament. Okay? And they aren't any different 
It's just a misunderstanding of love and holiness. You need to balance those two views. Very important. God is holy and just. And he is loving and merciful. And those characteristics are described all in one verse of Scripture over and over again throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so he makes the statement here. Last, Jesus proves his unity with the Father. Notice from verse 10 and 11, this is his point. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So he's questioning Philip. Don't you believe this? Don't you get this? Don't you understand that we are, the, are one in the same? And then he says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. So notice that Jesus addresses both his words and his works. So his words are authenticated by his works. So what he declared about himself, he proves by what he did. Now what does that what do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, the works of Christ are, are the ultimate proof. And if you put every other religious leader in the world that has ever lived up to the same standard, of what Jesus is declared right here, then you see an obvious difference right away. How do I, let me explain. In John 10, verse 25, here Jesus is pointing us, and this and many verses that I'm going to read to you right now, he's pointing you to the fact of his works. This is the proof of his words. He says there, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. That is what bears witness of the truth. John 10, 38. He says, Though you do not believe in me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Same thing as what he's just declared in our text this morning. Then finally, John 20, verse 30 and 31. This is John's testimony uh, at the end of this, this gospel. He says, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So that means all we have is a few of the miracles that Jesus did. And you, you say, well, there's a whole lot of miracles in the gospels. That's right. But he did a whole bunch of more gospel or miracles that are not in the gospels. So think about that. Multitudes of other healings and uh, salvations, uh, people raised from the dead that are not listed in the gospels. He says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so, why were these miracles written down? So that we would believe the testimony that he gave. It's that simple. So Jesus says here in verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Now this is, again, in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. He's commanding Philip and the rest of the disciples who are listening to this, he's commanding them, you need to believe this. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So do you put your faith in these works that he has done? I hope that you will. In fact, when you share with people about the other religious systems, just ask them. When did Buddha walk on water? When did Confucius walk on water? When did Muhammad walk on water? Well, nowhere. Uh, when did Muhammad raise the dead? When did Confucius raise the dead? Buddha raised the dead? Or anybody else that claims that they're 
some religious figure. They didn't do any of these things because they are not the Messiah. It's the bottom line. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Believe in the signs that he has done because they prove who he, who he is. And the ultimate sign is what? The, the resurrection. The resurrection is the ultimate sign. You see, all of the other religious figures, they're all dead. They're in their grave. They're in their tomb. Or they've been cremated. I mean, Buddha and Confucius, they were cremated. But Muhammad is in his tomb. Jesus has no tomb. He is alive. And with the power that Jesus walked this earth with, for him not to have a tomb someplace, that's very unusual, let me tell you. It's not, it's more than unusual. It's a sign. There is no, no body anywhere. He is alive. And one day, those who believe that are going to see him face to face. And they are going to absolutely have all the assurance that they need at that moment. But what assurance do you have today that you really know him? Well, the ultimate assurance is that you have proof because you have life inside you. In 1 John 5, 12, it says this, He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, John writes it in that manner, very similar to what he wrote in John 20, verse 31. He said, These were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. You see, that's the ultimate proof. So do you have life inside? Do you have that spiritual life inside? And do you know the difference between that and what it was like before you came to Christ? Do you remember the difference between the two? Because... There is a radical difference. The emptiness, I mean searching for life in things or pleasure or position. You think, oh, this is, this is where it's at. This is what I need. Or, you know, I mean every single commercial you see on television is either trying to tell you where life is really found. Oh, go, go vacation here. This is... This is where real life is. Or, you know, you need to have these set of clothes or this lipstick or whatever. Whatever the commercial is, it's this is where it's at. Do you remember the difference between that and what you have today? Now you say, well, I'm feeling really, I'm a Christian, Steve, but I'm really dead inside today. Well, that's a warning to you to get on your knees, get on your face, and say, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with life. Because that's the only proof that I know Him. That's it. It's the only proof that you have inside of you that you know Him. So if you're walking with Him, and you're obeying Him, you're following Him, You're going to have life, and that more abundantly. That's what Jesus promises to give. So I encourage you today, if you don't have that life, you need to respond to him. If you're here and you've never made a commitment to Christ, you need to do that today. You need to just simply humble your heart, ask his forgiveness, invite Jesus to come in and take over your life, and he will give you that life that simple and it's that easy it's really not a difficult thing but you've got to be willing to turn from your sin and follow him with your heart let's go to him in prayer father thank you today that lord you have made your the way so simple lord we thank you that we know the way we know the truth we know the life lord you are 
that life. And so, Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We come through the righteous act of his cross and his resurrection. We come to you, Lord, in faith. And we ask, Lord, that you would, Lord, I just ask that you would believe, touch each and every believer here in our midst this, this morning. Just touch us with your, your life, your power, your joy. Lord, put within us that desire, that motivation to seek you. Lord, you're not going to just drop all that you want to give in our lap. Lord, you ask us to seek you, to pursue you, to put you first in our lives. That's your, that's your requirement. So, Lord, we do that. We choose to bow our knee to you this morning and surrender to you. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian or you're not following him, or you haven't been following Him, or you don't have any life inside of you, do you want that life? If you do, will you humble yourself this morning? Ask God's forgiveness for your sin and invite Him to come in. He will do that. If you, if you just cry out to Him right now in prayer, He'll do it. Let me just lead you in prayer right now. Lord, will, I come to you as a sinner. Say those words to Him. I come as a sinner. Forgive me my sins. Jesus, come in and take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your spirit. And change me. If you just prayed that prayer with me, will you just acknowledge, yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. Just lift your hand here, a simple acknowledgement. I'd like to pray for you. Anyone here? God bless you. Anyone else here this morning? God bless you. Anyone else? Lord, we pray you touch these hearts, Lord. Change. Lord, just bring your power. Fill their, their lives, even at this moment. Bear witness inside of them with your life. Lord, we believe you're doing that even at this moment. Bless you, Lord. We praise you for all that you have done and what you've done right here, touching these lives. Change them forever. May you keep them all the days of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.